Welcome everyone. I'm, I'm Nancy Gertner. I am not Arthur Miller. Let me repeat that. I'm not Arthur Miller. Uh, Arthur uh, could not participate. This is his sort of signature kerfuffle, uh, where he gets lots of very smart people uh, in, uh, to essentially talk about an issue without formal presentations. There are no formal presentations. People will talk for just a short, uh, uh, give an introduction of who they are, and then uh, one or two sentences about what they're interested in, uh, and then we will begin. Broadly speaking, the topic is access to justice. But access to justice issues today don't come about as a result of uh, the Congress you know, suddenly repealing this or that statute, which would garner a huge amount of reaction in the country. Nor do they really come about in even Supreme Court decisions that say with any clarity, uh, we think that this area of the law should be shut down. We think people shouldn't have access to the courts on this issue. Rather, these issues come about by indirection. Indirection, which is the way the Supreme Court has dealt with arbitration and the extent to which it has privileged arbitration over, other, over litigation, the extent to which arbitration, in fact, uh, has replaced class action litigation in courts. Waivers of class actions have been affirmed, have been endorsed, not only just affirmed, but endorsed by the Supreme Court, forcing people into individual arbitration, and that has implications for uh, access to justice issues. Um, uh, also with implications for access to justice issues is the way even within the individual cases, even assuming an individual case, assuming an individual case in court, how this, the court has been interpreting uh, rules with respect to motions to dismiss, how they've been interpreting motions for summary judgment, how the new rules impact on that. So even with respect to individual cases, there's a question of whether we can accomplish even in an individual case what we had been accomplished before. Uh, in addition, even with respect to class actions, assuming now a fully, uh, full-blown class action in court, what are the rules with respect to class actions? What are the narrowing about it? So it's not an easy topic because essentially the access issues are addressed in a thousand different ways rather than in ways that are necessarily immediately clear and the point of this panel is to make it abundantly clear to you in a fun way. Uh, are we what? I'm being, Caroline, have we begun to be too early? No, not at all. Sorry, I was just trying to sign into the lobby call. Okay, okay. I take direction very well. Um, okay. Um, th these issues are not just access to just, justice issues in the sense of whether an individual can go to court and raise an individual claim, an individual can go to court and raise a class action claim, an individual, uh, what arbitration is like. But we in the United States enforce civil rights, securities, antitrust, and a whole host of other public uh, rights through courts. We didn't create an enforcement mechanism. The model was a private attorney's general. And if we begin to narrow access to justice, we begin to narrow the enforcement of public rights. Uh, so broadly speaking, that's what we're going to talk about. Um, I will be the moderator in the sense that I will then be judge-like and interrupt at will. <laughs> this is what I miss. Uh, so we'll begin in the, in the back row where people will just say their name and where they're from and just very briefly what they're interested in and then we shall be off. Beginning with you, Adam. Okay, terrific. Adam Klein, Allen & Golden, uh, New York. Uh, I handle uh, class action employment and uh, impact litigation. Mark Gross, Pomerantz firm, and we represent public pension funds in securities fraud law uh, class actions. Uh, Alan Morrison, I teach civil procedure and other things at George Washington Law School, and I side with the plaintiffs. <laughs> <laughs> I'm shocked. Uh, Jonathan Smith, the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. We're a civil rights law firm. I work in our e economic justice group, which does uh, employment and housing discrimination work. My name is Eric Kramer. I'm a, uh, a lawyer at Berger and Montague in Philadelphia, and I spend my days and nights 
litigating antitrust class actions on the front line. Suzette Malveau, I'm a law professor at Catholic University. Um, I think maybe one of the few um, law professors on the panel, so I think my comments will be a little nerdier than the rest. I'm going to talk about transubstantivity. <laughs> okay, transubstantivity, you have to write that down. Go on. Fatima Goss Graves, I'm the Vice President for Education and Employment at the National Women's Law Center. Uh, our employment work focuses largely on pay discrimination, pregnancy discrimination, and workplace harassment. You don't have to talk fast, it just has to be short sentences. Ne Myron? Uh, my name is Mike Cherry. <clears throat> I'm from Chicago, Illinois. Uh, I do plaintiff's business litigation, uh, not so much class action, but just uh, disputes, uh, and uh, almost uh, always on a contingent fee basis. Paul Bland, I'm executive director of public justice. Um, for about 15 years, I've mostly spent my career challenging uh, forced arbitration clauses. Uh, before the Concepcion case, I won a lot of huge cases. Um, since the Concepcion case, I've lost all my huge cases, and I win a lot of small cases. <laughs> I'm Scott Powell from Birmingham, Alabama. I'm in private practice. I'm interested in MDLs, MDL structure, common benefit fees, cl uh, class actions, and, um, and restrictions on those. Uh, Harry Sussman from Sussman Godfrey. Um, I was going to talk about transubstantivity, but since, <laughs> since that's got that covered, it's I a guess hot I'll, topic. I know. I don't even know what it means. Uh, but uh, I'll, my firm is interested in uh, class actions on uh, antitrust, consumer class actions, um, and uh, but we also do we're primarily plaintiffs. We do securities class actions as well. But we also do a little bit of defense work. So I have a. I'd say 90% pro plaintiff's view, but there is the occasion in which I cross over to the dark side. <laughs> John? Uh, I'm John Beisner. I'm a partner at Skadden Arps in Washington and uh, do all sorts of class actions uh, on the defense side. Hi, um, Elizabeth Cabraser. I work at Leaf Cabraser in San Francisco and New York and represent plaintiffs in class actions and aggregate litigation uh, transubstantively. <laughs> I have no idea what transubstant. <laughs> they can't even pronounce it. Uh, I'm David Brodsky. I'm the ACS board chair. I used to be uh, a trial lawyer on both the plaintiffs and defense side, mostly defense. Now I'm a moderate, a mediator, which means I'm a neutral, and which means I have no views of any substance in today's program. You can leave, David. <laughs> I'm Alan Diamond with the firm of Diamond McCarthy. I operate out of our firm's Houston and New York offices. We do, and I do. I'm a trial lawyer on the commercial litigation side, mostly on the plaintiff side and mostly contingency fee. Uh, my name is Cyrus Mary. I'm based here in Washington, D.C. I'm not neutral. I'm on the plaintiff side. We do class actions and civil rights work. Okay, I think I want to begin with Paul and with Elizabeth. Um, I promised I wouldn't call on anyone. I lied. Uh, so the general question, which is what has the impact of this new robust arbitration done to class actions and whether that's a good or a bad thing? Paul and then Elizabeth? You described your life as being over, so I thought you would be a good person to start with. Yeah, uh, the, the Concepcion and Italian Colors cases are just catastrophic for access to justice in America. Um, a gigantic number of valid, powerful consumer and employment class actions, antitrust class actions, have been wiped away for no other reason than that the company adopted a forced arbitration clause that let them opt out of the law. Um, I lost after Concepcion a case in the Third Circuit against American Express where they were cheating people on their rebates and um, uh, they'd say you get 5%, they'd never give anyone 5%. And the Third Circuit found that we had proven that the arbitration clause offered an illusory remedy and they enforced it anyhow. Um, I lost a case in the Ninth Circuit against AT&T Mobility where the court found we had proven that only an infinitesimal number of consumers would be able to go forward and they said that didn't matter, that Justice Scalia meant for the arbitration clause to be enforced and for everyone just to lose their rights under the consumer protection laws. Um, if you look at the evidence in, this, in the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau's preliminary report, the total number of consumers in America who bring cases against lenders in an average year is about 400 for all lending, so that's all credit cards, all checking accounts, payday lenders, auto title pawn lenders, everything, 400 individual cases a year. 
Um, by contrast, they gave examples of uh, just eight class actions that had gotten 13 million people, hundreds of millions of dollars of relief. Um, uh, I had three cases where I was co-counsel, which we settled in a year where we got checks out to over 200,000 people. We cleaned their credit records. We got um, illegal debts wiped away. Under forced arbitration, we had a second round of cases in the same court and all in the same issues. Our cases were completely wiped away, and a bunch of poor people had the law violated. They were cheated, and they get nothing. Wiped away in the sense that they're forced to individually arbitrate rather than ar rather than litigate as a class. Right. And sorry. Yeah, no, no go on. I was just going to say, we use, the plaintiff's bar tends to use the phrase forced arbitration to mean that our clients are not really given a choice, that all the, all the companies in the area have the clauses, it's pre-dispute, they don't know about them, they don't understand that they're doing it. So there's the idea that this is all consensual, which is sort of the justification for it. For my clients, that's not true. They learn about the arbitration clause typically from me. Okay. Elizabeth, you think it the same way? or? You're the most hopeful group in your comments to me. I'm always hopeful, always have been, always will be. I have to be in order to get up in the morning and do what I do, um, often proved wrong. But here's, here's why I'm optimistic. If you look at what's happened with arbitration, what you see really, uh, and I'm going to use that transubstantive word, is an attempt to privatize our justice system. And that is just fundamentally incompatible with who we are as a country. We fought a war of independence. If you read the Declaration of Independence, which I know you all have in your tote bags, you will find out that one of the big problems was there was a private justice system. You had to pay to play. And people didn't have access to local courts and local justice. At the time, the cure was the individual jury trial, because that's what people knew, and it was quick, and it was cheap, and, and that was access. Today, where most wrongs are, are mass wrongs, access to justice means the ability to invoke representative litigation, aggregate litigation, all of the forms and structures that are in our fe federal rules, but in a public process so that the parties and the decision makers are accountable to the people. Because if we're going to abandon that system, then we're going to abandon who we are and who we fought to become and who we are still fighting to become as a democracy. Now, there, are, there is such a thing as a class action arbitration. I mean, as a class arbitration, right? I mean, you can have class arbitrations, can't you, David? I, I've, I've seen or it done, and you can, but the problem is this. Again, it's public versus private. When the decision isn't public, when the decision is not appealable, when the decision is not reasoned, when those who are affected by the decision do not have notice, when you don't have the basic basic indicia of due process in operation. That's the problem. And what's happened is, I think the courts have been trying to save class actions by destroying them, because class actions in operation often aren't perfect. Notice isn't perfect. Uh, people might not learn that they can opt out. Uh, the representatives may not be adequate, which is the term of art. And so in order to address imperfections, uh, the courts have required perfection to a degree that may not be possible in actual practice. And so what has happened is not only has uh, the, 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 the uh, best become the enemy of the good, but the perfect has become the enemy of the best. And in many cases, the class action uh, structure is the best thing we have to efficiently and fairly adjudicate mass wrongs in a public accountable process. Alan, your hand up. Yeah, I, I agree with Elizabeth, but I take it one step further. I think it's more than just moving towards a privatization uh, of rights. Uh, if you look at what the Supreme Court did in the Italian Colors case in Concepcion, you have, uh, and I'll give you an example, um, 100 million people were affected by the AT&T mobility case that were bound by that uh, by that ruling. That's more than, than the number of people that vote for a presidential election in the United States. Now, what choice do those people have if they don't want to sign that adhesion contract with the class action uh, waiver? I say it's not a matter of, of any choice, really, because if you, if you say, well, they don't have to buy a phone. Well, it's not just AT&T. If they want to buy a phone from Verizon or Sprint or whoever, they're all going to have that same adhesion contract with the same um, class action 
uh, waiver in it. And so effectively, you're telling people that they can't live in the 21st century because they can't use a telephone uh, uh, unless they agree to be bound by this provision in, in, in buried print in an adhesion contract when they go to sign up with their phone carrier. Can't they bargain for something? Can't they bargain for, for uh, you know, no arbitration? Don't, uh, David, it doesn't even gonna, deserve an answer. I, Nancy, Nancy I, actually, I actually think that's, you're putting your finger on one of the really significant issues in this area because we can go around the room and include members of the audience, and I think we will all agree that those two decisions and the lower court decisions that follow them have pretty much um, either totally eliminated or on the verge of eliminating the traditional consumer class actions and, and securities and antitrust class actions as we've known them. But if you get back to the point that Alan just made, which is you cannot live in the 21st century without access to, let's say, let's say telephones or access to credit cards, and you go back to the issues of adhesion, consensual, <coughs> consensual on conduct or unconscionability and go back to those cases and re begin to redefine what the concept of adhesion is and unconscionability is and consent is. If you go back to those cases, you realize that they were not really talking about these, the kind of relationships that we're discussing now in the 21st century where there actually was, as you said, well, why don't you just bargain for it? You can't bargain in this context. So you need to go back, we need to go back to those cases and redefine in litigation what it, it means to be in, a, un, in an unconscionable situation. Buy a phone and give up your rights, or don't buy a phone and go live in a cave. And I don't think those are the choices. I think a rational court, when faced with some of those choices, will begin to peel away at this, at the doctrine. That it, I, I don't, I, this is a rhetorical question. Is the Supreme Court a rational court? Alan. Right, right. Yeah. Well, I mean, the FAA, the courts just enacted, or decided rather, that the FAA wiped out rights of employees in the area I practice. There's no one to bargain with. It's, you know, there, there could be a rational discussion about limiting class actions or reforming or whatever in exchange for the continuation of the right to bring them. But here, the court just to simply usurp that. And um, there's no one to, uh, to bargain with, literally. Well, actually, you do. So the one question was, is this only consumer class actions? Is this only antitrust class actions? Securities class actions? Adam, you do employment. Yeah, right. So it, it's interesting. A free uh, cell phone wiped out civil rights enforcement. That's literally, and, and I have to say, we're, <laughs> we're quite mad about it. The civil rights community, folks who are trying to make the lives of employees better, uh, and have that mandate have lost uh, an incredibly powerful tool. And it's really uh, a situation where we cannot uh, undo that. There's no one to negotiate with. There's no one who's gonna say to us, well, that's not a fair outcome and let's fix it. Who's on the other side of that discussion? Um, yeah, Mark. I can bring a perspective from the securities law practice uh, because back in the I think it was even as early as the 90s, there was efforts to quote unquote reform securities laws by uh, Hal Scott's uh, committee and suggested arbitration be built into the charters of many corporations and that way forestall any securities fraud actions in the court, including class actions. Um, that actually became enacted as part of a proposed registration statement by Carlisle, um, one of the mega uh, corporations out there. But the SEC put the blocks on that and said, we're not going to sanction that for a corporation. And so query whether or not, yes, we fortunately didn't have to go battle this, at least this round in the courts, um, we did get a federal agency that saw its vested interest in protecting um, investors as um, being blocked by this proposal. Uh, query whether the, the new Consumer Federal uh, Protection Agency, which seems to be very activist, but is focusing maybe on payday loans and other things, maybe that's another conduit to bring that type of challenges. I do know, though, that we are facing other challenges in securities laws. There are now forum selection clauses that have been upheld by Delaware saying that if you're bringing a, a corporate governance claim, you have to bring it in Delaware, and that's been upheld. 
There was most recently, and perhaps most threateningly, a clause that said loser pay. And that is a case called ATP. It was just announced in June, and it was a dispute between a corporation and an affiliate. And the Delaware court said um, it, where there is a loser pay provision and you sue and you're an investor and you sue the corporation, um, you are subject to that change of the whole American system. Um, this happened to be a non-public company. It's not clear whether it will be applied across the board. There was an effort to fix this, and the Delaware Corporation Council actually got behind the fix. It was blocked at the last minute by the Chamber of Commerce, and it's going to roll over into next year. But it's something definitely to be watched for anybody looking for not only investor protection, but potentially another way by which Okay, if you can have forced arbitration, can you have forced loser pay? Oh, goodness. Fatima, did you have your hand up? I did. You know, I'm just thinking about when you're talking about negotiation in the context of employment, especially if you're talking about in jobs that are rigid in every way for every reason. You can't ask to change your schedule. You can't, you know, if you're talking about really rigid jobs, the idea that a low wage worker is going to negotiate. In, at the time of hire, the, the choice is do you have a job or not? And so when, when we're thinking about this, uh, when employers have policies that uh, say things like they won't accommodate pregnant workers, for example, that's the type of thing you're not going to be able to have that negotiation in advance about what you would do in the situation if you just so happened to get pregnant and how would you resolve that? Right. You want to anticipate what the choice, you want to anticipate that problem, you want to anticipate the choice of form. Jonathan, you had your hand up before. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on what Adam said because I think, that, you know, as civil rights lawyers, we often think that what happens in the context of consumers or securities are so distinct from what we do. And the reality is that you know, our clients and the issues that we care about are being deeply implicated by what's happening in areas of law that at first glance seem like they have no you know, kind of implications for us. And I think the, the point that Elizabeth made about the privatization of justice is particularly important in the context of civil rights. You know, anyone who is vaguely familiar with the civil rights movements knows the fundamental role that the federal courts played. It provided a, a venue and an avenue for, for whether it was African Americans, women, uh, LGTB communities to have a forum to actually get some relief. And if we take away that access, if we take away that, that forum that has tremendous implications to the ability of, of, of all these communities to actually seek meaningful relief and get justice. Yes, Myron. Myron or Mike? Uh, either one will do. Okay. Uh, I think uh, there is some form of uh, hopefulness, uh, uh, as Elizabeth alluded to. A democracy can't exist unless there is an objective method for resolving business disputes. And this doesn't necessarily mean just consumer disputes against industry. This means industry against industry. I remember uh, uh, some of the development of the law of proximate cause, for example, in the 70s and 80s uh, in California and elsewhere, uh, where business disputes uh, helped move that law. If you remember the beginning of the antitrust movement in 1956, it was uh, big-time public companies suing General Electric for price fixing. So this will happen uh, eventually, uh, and the people who foster arbitration will uh, sort of be hoisted on their own petard. I think uh, we have to sort of move it along, uh, creative plaintiff's lawyers. I think another thing that can be done that uh, the businesses uh, are not necessarily looking for is creating another dispute which isn't subject to arbitration. Let's say, for example, you're uh, suing company X that has a piece of proprietary uh, formula that they don't want public. If you can figure out a creative strategic way to get uh, at least an argument about making uh, that information uh, public, you can get some leverage. So this isn't something that's going to change overnight, but I think uh, the, the people uh, in the plaintiff's bar who find creative ways uh, of uh, dealing with this eventually, 
uh, how long, I don't know, we'll be able to um, create instances which will uh, change uh, this law. Okay, let me go to Eric. Uh, you asked whether the, the Supreme Court was rational. Yes. I think you meant it to See, be. See, now my chances on the Supreme Court are shot, yeah. so I can say anything. <laughs> yeah. Anything. I think you meant it to be rhetorical. I would say yes, they're very rational. I think they know exactly what they're doing. Um, and the point I would, would make is that there are opinions that appear to be pro-arbitration from the Supreme Court, but they're not really pro-arbitration. They are, they're anti-liability. They're pro-immunity is what they are. And, and one way I see that, and, and to make an optimistic point, is I, in my practice, um, do antitrust class actions, and the entities that have claims in antitrust class actions are the direct purchasers. Uh, at least federal claims for overcharges. And those tend to be small businesses or medium-sized businesses. And what, I, what I'm seeing or not seeing is a lot of arbitration clauses or too many arbitration clauses. And I think the reason for that is businesses, when they actually have real disputes with other businesses, don't really like arbitration. They'd rather have a courtroom. They'd rather be able to present their, um, their case in a court. And so, there are many industries where they could have opted for immunity from class actions, but they have not because it would have caused all of the other business disputes that those entities have with each other to be in arbitration where they, many of them don't want to be. But are you following up on, on uh, Myron's point that essentially the pressure to de-emphasize arbitration is going to come from corporations? It, it might. Uh, I mean, my own personal experience with arbitration is that they can be highly inefficient because, for example, arbitrators don't have the power to compel people to show up on any particular date, uh, witnesses. Uh, the arbitration that I did took literally two years to try. I, and, my, my personal favorite is reinsurance arbitration. I have to say this. I do reinsurance arbitration. The parties begin by saying, you're supposed to say, do you want a reasoned decision or a non-reasoned decision? And I said that, although it made no sense to me. The party said they wanted a non-reasoned decision, at which point I was about to say, you win, I'm out of here. <laughs> Alan. Yeah, you know, I've, I've been accused by most people that know me as a guy that sees the glass half full. But I have to say, to take Mike's point, and I agree with who behind me was just speaking, he's absolutely right. I do a lot of commercial arbitration, and I don't believe for one second with all due respect, that the answer is going to be found in business-to-business -business arbitration cases. I, I'm much more pessimistic about that because they do not like, generally, business-to-business -business cases to arbitrate. Hmm. It's quite the opposite in, in the, uh, from the consumer perspective. If as, as many cases that go to international and domestic arbitration in the commercial area, there are m multiple X factors that don't because companies don't like to put arbitration clauses. Why don't they? Because the, the standard bearer for why you arbitrate in a commercial context is that it's less costly and more expedient. You're going to get to your result faster and it's going to cost less. I've, you know, it's, it's anecdotal, but I have found just the opposite. Right. Arbitration tends to be just as expensive as if, as if I'm in court and it takes just as long a time to do it, and there's no rights of appeal. And here's what corporations do, any in-house general counsel. They look at a case, if they have an arbitration provision in it, um, obviously they would, they would be stuck, but they, they first determine um, what do they think of their case. If they have exposure, and they think they have exposure, they're gonna settle the case. It's when they think they're absolutely right that they want to fight. And when they want to fight, they want to fight in court. They don't want to fight in an arbitration setting because in court they have their full rights, not only of appeal, rights to take the discovery, introduce the evidence that they want. And transparency. As and transparency. Thing. So I, I would submit that I don't think the answer is going to be found in the business-to-business -business corporate world uh, of solving this arbitration so problem. So let's have a few more answers on the arbitration issue, Cyrus. Yeah, I was just going to pick up on the point about immunity. One of the things that was really troubling about the Italian colors decision was Justice Scalia really made it pretty explicit that the illusion of remedy is okay. And I think once you do that for us as a country, we've diminished ourselves because having robust securities enforcement made our securities laws a place where people around the world wanted to invest. 
doing away with price fixing with enforcement and antitrust, having employees be able to go to the workplace and fight discrimination. That's what makes us a better country. That's what makes us exceptional. And I think one of the ironies is, is that the whole class action rule is a neutral rule, and it has a benefit for both sides. It has efficiency, it has transparency, it has global peace for the defendant. And if you take, for example, Title VII cases or cases that are bringing injunctive relief, it's good for the defendant to have one solution of what the changed policies and practices are. Otherwise, you have hundreds of people bringing different cases that bring out inconsistent rulings. I mean, there's a, there's a practicality to this that I think is lost to the other side that's really on this mission to create immunity. Although that's related to what Elizabeth said at the beginning, which is that you're talking about raising the standards for class actions that they have to be perfect, otherwise they cannot proceed, but allowing all the imperfections of arbitration to continue without, and that's your point about it didn't matter that there was, this was not a meaningful remedy, you nevertheless had to arbitrate. Right, but they, what they were, were trying to do is to make sure that people came in one by one. What they're really on a mission to do is to do away with class actions, which are a meaningful remedy. And when they were saying to Italian colors, okay, well, even if it costs 500000 for an individual to hire all their experts and bring their case, and for a $50,000 claim, then they should just go ahead and do that. But no rational actor would do that. Would do that. John, you raise your hand up. I think I'm a little outnumbered uh, here on viewpoints, but uh, I think my job here is maybe to be a little provocative. So let me just raise one, one issue uh, uh, that, that has permeated the foregoing discussion. And that is this, I think, assumption in the discussion that class actions equal justice. And I'm not talking about the imperfections that we're, we're talking about here. Paul, I agree with you. I think that there are definitely examples out there of class actions where there has been injunctive relief given and monetary relief given that are a credit to the class action device and, and, and I, I, I think that that's, that's absolutely accurate. I think most of those though are in cases where you go into the litigation having a list of the class members. You know who they are. That's not true in most consumer class actions. And I, I, the cautionary note I would, would, uh, would raise here is that in those cases where, where you don't know exactly who the class members are, when you have a settlement, for example, there is a projection given to the court by both sides that says we assume a level of participation and relief to the class that is, is usually at a very high level. Fees are then awarded on that basis and the court simply doesn't know how many people participated in the settlement. And what we're seeing now in the Third Circuit's baby products decision and in other cases is a revelation that the participation levels are quite low. I, I was struck by a declaration that was filed recently in a case in a federal district court in Florida by one of the larger claims uh, outfits in the country, the people who take in the claims, and they say that um, the median claims rate in the cases that they have handled, and I have to say I don't know which cases they were looking at, but this was an effort uh, to provide a, a median, was 0.23% less than one, much less than 1% claims. And so I think if you look at a substantial number of class actions, what you will find is that the main movement of relief is to the attorneys who are handling the case. Very little gets to the class members. And so I, I think we need to be careful about speaking in, in you know, uniform terms, I don't mean to be doing that, but there is a huge block of class actions out there where I think if you look at the end, most of the money, most of the relief went to the attorneys who brought the case and very little got to class members. Raising questions about there may be imperfections with this and is the it, way to address it to essentially it, it, extinguish people, extinguish it and well, send it to Well, it's more than, than imperfections, though. This is, these are not justice because the class members aren't getting anything. Indeed, I think the question is, when is somebody going to start bring, bringing malpractice actions against 
the lawyers who brought these cases. Uh, you know, the, the, the settlement, the settlements were approved, but 95% of the money that was recovered was kept by the lawyers. And the class is already certified, folks. The, the, uh, as I said, the leaderboard has now, uh, we'll start with Paul, Elizabeth, Harry. That was the point of the comment. Okay. I, I just want one quick thing on class actions is that uh, we, we've more. provided to the CFPB um, scores, scores of cases in which um, uh, everyone in the class got a check sent to them directly. The, the famous 0.23% is in a retail product in which nobody was sent a notice. It was just a publication notice. So, so for those class actions where no one gets a notice and they bought something over the counter and there's something in Parade Magazine, the redemption rates are bad. But that's not the typical thing. The one thing, if I could go off class actions just for a second quickly about the employment cases that, um, that Adam and Jonathan were saying. First, when the Supreme Court extended the Arbitration Act, the employment setting in the Circuit City case, it's absolutely clear to everybody that the legislative history for the 1925 Act is that Congress never, never intended that act to cover employment cases. The Federal Arbitration Act the of 1925. Federal, right, on. and, and what Which Justice Kennedy did. Which predated all the Civil Rights Acts. Justice Kennedy said, well, you know, the, the burden, these, he said these employment cases, these civil rights cases are a burden on the federal courts, and this is a way to, to reduce that burden. And so they just ignored <laughs> history in it. The other thing is that in individual cases, put aside class actions, in individual cases in the employment area, we actually have really good data, unlike the consumer area where hardly anyone arbitrates. So in employment, over, over every single employment case that the AAA has ever handled, compared to a comparable size of cases in, in court, a professor at, um, at Cornell has proven that in arbitration, employees are much less likely to win a case than they would be to win in court. And if they do win in a court case in arbitration, they win on average about 20 to 25% of the typical winnings in court. So forced arbitration works incredibly badly for, for employees outside of the class action um, thing. And this is an area where the law was, it, it, didn't, it didn't jump, it was pushed. Uh, the next person is Elizabeth. You had a comment, and Harry, yeah, and then I, Mark. I, I think we have to be very careful uh, to to keep uh, selective statistics from destroying class actions because there are consumer cases, uh, over-the-counter retail products where there are no records, uh, where the notice program is less than optimal, where the claims program is less than robust, and you're going to get a very low uptake rate. Uh, you're also going to get a very low uptake rate if it's an old case if it's taken 10 years or so uh, from inception uh, to go through the certification, appellate battles, settlement negotiations. So uh, I think time is the enemy uh, in, in all litigation and particularly in class actions. And unfortunately, uh, in the strive to perfect class actions, we've added time and delay and expense. But the good news is that even in the most difficult class actions to deliver benefits to class members, uh, we now have new tools. Uh, the internet is our friend in this area. It's less expensive and more uh, cost effective if lawyers and courts are willing to push for and insist on that and to be creative and to take the effort and to do it. Uh, no lawyer who represents a class in any of these areas of law uh, wants to be uh, the person uh, that, that, that somebody can say, well, this case was all about you. It was only about you. You got most of the money. None of us do this for that reason. And so to use selective statistics to say some class actions didn't do their jobs as we would hope to eliminate anybody's opportunity to improve in the area, I think particularly at this, this juncture, uh, is wrong because I think we, uh, every claims administrator I speak to, every notice administrator I speak to can give me a litany of things that didn't work, things they want to try, things they can do better, ways to improve the system. And remember, uh, even in the worst class action that delivers the lowest level of benefits to class members, if you compare it to an arbitration system, the class action did better every time. If what we're interested in is not only delivering money back to people that have been defrauded or mistreated, but if we are interested in protecting rights to access and we are interested in deterring bad conduct, I want any company out there to know if they don't treat its customer, if it doesn't treat the customers right, if it doesn't compete fairly, uh, if it doesn't provide a good workplace, then there is somebody out there who can bring a case into a public setting and hold them to account. 
uh, for that's disgorgement an and restitution, if not compensation. But that's an interesting question about the role of the internet. Let me finish this string with Harry and, and Mark, and then I want to go into arbitration, because one of the people in the audience was talking about labor arbitration as not having the same resonance as consumer antitrust arbitration. So, Harry. Yeah, I mean, what uh, has been alluded to is this, uh, Essentially, it's an effort by, I mean, the Third Circuit, and I suspect the Supreme Court will get into it, to base effectively eliminate uh, class actions that involve, you know, small purchases of consumer items. Because in those cases, and what they're using as the guise now is that you can't really identify, or it's difficult to identify who the class members are who purchased the item. Uh, heretofore, that had not really been a huge obstacle because there were the courts kind of were, they were pretty liberal about it in these situations because it's difficult. I mean, it's almost impossible, but on the other hand, you, the, you let the defendant completely get off scot-free, uh, particularly if, you know, the, the nature of the product is such that it's hard to really track who bought it. Uh, and if, you know, this, the problem is I just don't think the courts should be ma making this policy decision, which is basically that these kinds of class actions suck, they're no good, the lawyers get a bunch of money, people don't benefit, and uh, because of that, they use some, you know, cooked up part of the rules to, you know, ascertainability is the element that they've hooked onto, and I just don't think that that's the proper forum for it. If Congress or the rule makers want to do it, uh, that makes sense, but I think this effort by uh, judges, uh, to eliminate, and that's what was really going on in Italian colors. I mean, they're, you know, they, uh, they're using the procedural rules to wipe out liability. Uh, let me go to Mark, but I mean, I just wanted to say that that also fit into this notion, at least putting aside labor arbitration, but we were talking about situations where Congress did not invest in a, an enforcement agency. The vehicle of enforcement was private attorneys generals. So that to some degree, if you then eliminate or undermine private attorneys generals in the way you're describing, when there is no comparable agency to enforce it, you're eliminating enforcement of the law. Mark. And I think I'd like to pick, pick up with your point there, Nancy, as well as find common this, ground. I'm Judge Nancy. Judge Nancy, right, yeah. right, I'm Judge sorry. Nancy. Well, you introduced yourself and you said, uh, that's okay. <laughs> as well as John, and at, at the, I, I've been doing class actions for 37 years, um, and only on the plaintiff's side, but at the risk of being voted off the island by my uh, brethren, um, I do think we have a problem with regard to the consumer cases where there are small individual claims and there's low participation, and quite often what's done with the monies and sometimes even one foregoes the entire process of claims distribution and goes to a cypre. And at the, the perception remains that the attorneys are driving this litigation for their own personal business benefits. And I think it's time for us to try to come up with additional answers to that. One of the thoughts that occurred to me was Yes, individual arbitration diffuses the whole recovery process, but, and, and that creates a difficulty. But as you suggest, there are other functions of class actions besides compensation. They are, as Elizabeth was referring to, deterrence, accountability. So query whether or not focusing on injunctive prospective relief through a class type of mechanism may be another way that we should be pushing the envelope. I don't know whether arbitration precludes injunctive relief, and it may well, I, I just don't know, but it would seem to me that that's another way by which our role as a private attorney general could be fostered. Now, it changes our whole compensation model because instead of being com compensated on the amount that we get recovered or put out there, it's how much time we put into a case, on, particularly on a fee-shifting situation. But that's something which I think could be a little more digestible by uh, those who just feel that the plaintiff's bar is out there looking for itself and that our cost benefit is not there as John seems to be alluding to. We've run into similar problems, I'll say, in the securities field because there we do have not, you know, we, we have a larger okay. participation, but it's still nowhere near 50 percent, and if you get 25 percent claims, that's good. 
but there's also been an argument it's circularity. You're taking money from one investor and essentially putting it into another investor's pocket. What's the, uh, and you have transactional costs, not subtransactional or whatever that well, is. Well, we're actually getting closer to transubstantivity in a moment. <laughs> I just want to, you may not realize this, ladies and gentlemen, but that moment is coming. Alan, and then, <laughs> which, is, which is the notion of treating uh, uh, procedural rules across all categories of cases. And that's part of what we're talking about as being problematic here. Alan. So first, I think we ought to give a star and award to John Beisner for combat pay. He's been the only person <laughs> here on the defense side today. I'm used to having that in other contexts, but John, thanks for showing up. Uh, <laughs> second, uh, I, I want to make two other points. One is that uh, much of what the Supreme Court is doing is not at the same level as no arbitration or wiping out class actions. I'm thinking about putting a bumper sticker on my car. It's called Overturn Jay McIntyre. And everyone will drive around, what is Overturn Jay McIntyre? Well, Jay McIntyre happens to be a terribly bad case that the Supreme Court has said that you, as a person who was injured by a dangerous product, may not be able to sue in your hometown, and you could go, in this case, to England to sue the person who made this dangerous machine. It's constitutionalized, so unlike the Federal Arbitration Act, Congress can't, can't fix it, a and has had two other cases in the meantime following up on the same due process argument. This is death by a thousand cuts, and it's low visibility. Nobody knows about it. Nobody's paying any attention to it. Oh, so next point I want to make is uh, there was also a case which, like the arbitration cases, came out the right way in this context called Atlantic Marine this year, and it is a forum selection clause case which as between two businesses, two grown-ups negotiating, perfectly sensible forum selection clause, co court says we're going to enforce it uh, in the federal court system, but wait till we start seeing forum selection clauses on top of arbitration clauses, not only get to arbitrate, but the forum is going to be in Guam, uh, or maybe the Antarctic. Uh, uh, anybody remember the Carnival Cruise case with that, that kind of case going on? So. Uh, <laughs> That's something we're going to have to worry about. And if you don't think your, your consumers understood the arbitration clauses, wait till they get the forum selection clauses uh, on, on top of it. So it's coming to a litigation forum near you in the immediate future. Let me just shift for a moment because I wanted to follow the strand of, uh, uh, for a moment, just following through on arbitration. David, in the materials that you you wanted to talk about good arbitration as opposed to bad arbitration. And it, or did I mis misinterpret it? Your, oh, I think and, I, and I think that the gentleman in the audience believe, talks about arbitration in a labor setting, which is, which is very different than what we're talking about. So I want to turn to that. I think in the appropriate case, um, there, there are appropriate cases for arbitration. I mean, arbitration was created um, under the Federal Arbitration Act basically to cut down the expense and, and the time uh, of, a, uh, of, a, of a regular civil litigation. And, and the irony here is that as arbitrations have changed in complexity, some arbitrations now are just exactly the same as civil litigation. You have the same electronic discovery issues, you have the same delays, you have the same issues associated with, with um, complexity that you have in civil litigation. But there is at the core of arbitration some really, really good ideas, which is you get a, a local panel, you get expedition, and you get a prompt result, and you don't have to worry about the appellate consequences of delay. Now, the flip side of all of that is mm -hmm. that in a complex case, you don't have reasoned decisions. The common law basically can be completely disregarded. There's no reasoning required, as Nancy uh, knows from her um, role as an arbitrator, the parties get to decide whether it's a reasoned decision, which means you have to put down your reasons, or an unreasoned decision, which basically says you win, you lose. And that, so, so there is no development of the law taking place in that kind of arbitration. And in fact, you can't appeal any, there's no error in fact or law that is great enough to, uh, absent corruption uh, or, uh, or a, a, you can a, seek an enforcement action, a relationship but it's a very between narrow an arbitrator ground. and a party. There's no error right. in fact or law that an arbitrator commits that can be appealed from. So what started as a really good idea has changed into, in, in some cases, a really bad idea. My, my point about the good arbitration is let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. 
there, there are some good cases, cases that deserve to be arbitrated. There are cases that don't. And what I am stressing in my, in my thought process here is, the, is that there are, if you emphasize in the right kinds of cases that there is no common law being developed, there is no reasoning required, there's no error in factor law that can be appealed from, and there are a lot of other pernicious consequences of, of, of arbitrations, there's going to be some brave set of jurists out there who are going to start making exceptions to what now appears to be barriers to, uh, to justice. And the kinds of exceptions would be to make a determination, which the Supreme Court has rejected, that this case is not an appropriate vehicle for arbitration, and therefore waiver provisions should not be enforced. It, it took 20 years to get to this point. I mean, the irony here is that when the PSLRA was adopted in 1995, it was thought to be um, a, a, to limit class actions. And what actually happened was it led to a resurgence of securities class actions. PSLRA securities litigation, go the, on. Uh, pri the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act. So new tactics were developed by the, de by the defense to begin to chip away at class actions and, and now we are where we are. So there's gotta be, if there's gonna be a counterattack, it has to be at the roots of what is the, what is the problem the Supreme Court is forcing uh, individual litigants into. And I, I think that the case can be made that appropriate, let's call them mass actions rather than class actions, the appropriate mass action can't be adequately tried in an arbitration. And if you begin to delineate the reasons why mass actions are, can't be adequately tried, then you, I think you're gonna get a court or two around there to begin to develop jurisprudence that basically says some, some kinds of, um, of actions really are m much more appropriate and should be in the federal court rather than in an arbitration court. So a court, the legislature, the rules process. Suzanne. Suzette. Suzette, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Um, so I, uh, I wanted to step back a little bit because I think um, you, you mentioned the rules process and uh, there are so many different ways that we might approach these kind of procedural problems. When I mentioned um, transubstantivity, I obviously stepped into it, so everybody has kind of chimed in on that. Um, many people on the dais have already actually alluded to transubstantivity without knowing it. Explain. So um, transubstantivity, as, as Judge Gartner mentioned, is just simply the rules, the federal rules of civil procedure are gonna apply across the board to all cases no matter what the underlying substantive rights are, right? So if it's a civil rights case or torts or contracts or whatever, you're gonna apply the federal rules of civil procedure um, to that case. So it's really a, a one size fits all model, right? And I think um, Elizabeth and Jonathan have kind of alluded to that, that how is it that this case over here that deals with uh, securities and class actions is going to affect the civil rights or something else. So you see the rules applying across the board, um, you know, no matter what the underlying substantive right is. And the thing, the thing about the federal rules is this notion, this, this word transubstantivity is considered a pillar of the civil litigation system. And I think since the rules have been enacted 75 years ago, and certainly the last 25 years, um, I think it's pretty clear that despite the fact that the rules are neutral on their face, that they're having this disproportionate negative impact in terms of civil rights and employment discrimination cases. So, um, you know, we've seen this, I think a number of people have already talked about that disparate impact, whether it's pleadings or class actions or summary judgment or arbitration. If any one of these, I mean, any one of these would be a problem um, in the civil rights and employment discrimination area, but if you look at the confluence of all of those, um, I think what's happening is this, this one-size-fits-all approach is having a negative impact, and it's basically undermining what the rules were designed to do. So the, the, the federal rules were designed to do basically two things. One is to provide access to the court system, and the second thing is to have a resolution on the merits. So it seems, um, I mean, in terms of the language of the rules, the interpretation, the application of the rules, I think it's pretty clear that it's having a negative disparate impact um, in certain areas, and certainly um, civil rights and employment discrimination. Um, one, one of the things I'll add is, 
Uh, I don't know how many of you saw Sherilyn Eiffel when she spoke yesterday, but it really struck a chord with me because one of the things she said was um, the law and rules are really a refuge for victims of discrimination. And uh, it's a place where it's supposed to be a safe haven. It's a safe space, right? It's a neutral place. And I think it's pretty clear that the, um, the rules are not, the, the rules are not performing in a neutral way, and it's particularly um, pernicious when you talk about process harms the very people that its protection um, was meant to, uh, is, is really, is, is the most important. But how do you undo that? That is a, I mean, that's a central pillar, as you said, of the right, federal right. rules. How do we begin to essentially say, okay, it may be one thing to have labor arbitration, it may be one thing with respect to equal, equal bargaining power, uh, players can can require arbitration. That all the rules ought to be different for employment. Might be different where there's an agency that that uh, so you don't need private attorneys general in the same way. Can we make these kinds of distinctions? Should I mean, the courts? They, uh, every you have uh, tons of local district courts that have special patent rules. For yes. I mean, they're you know that's common to, yes. to see. So uh, there's no real reason why the federal rules couldn't do the same thing. That, well, Suzette? Yeah, so I mean, I think one thing you could do, and certainly a number of us in this room have done this, is that it's the focus to be on the advisory committee, the ones who are actually making the rules. And this is the advisory committee of the, the advisory committee to the rules committee of the judicial conference. conference. Right, right. And so the, the rule, the rule making process is that you weigh in, you weigh in on the ground, right, where you have the advisory committee, and that's the place where these are the folks who are required to create the rules and, you know, and are, are tasked with making sure that the rules actually provide efficiency and justice, right? That they balance those two things as, as stated in rule, rule number one. Um, and that you require them to run through a disparate impact test, right? Very much like we have a disparate impact um, test in Title VII. If you know that these rules are gonna have some kind of disparate impact on a particular category of claimants or claims, then that, amendment should not be appropriate. And it so it doesn't work so well with arbitration because that's seen as statutory well, yeah, interpretation. Yeah, yeah. But when you talk about the class action rules, and we're sort of alive, moving into motion to dismiss standards, discovery standards as exactly. well, then that might be a legitimate right. place to look. Adam. Who appoints the, who appoints the uh, members of the advisory committee? John team? Roberts appoints yes, the, okay. right, that's no right. Yes, okay, no further questions. That's right. Um, uh, uh, I, I can say again, this is now I can be honest for the first time, I used to raise my hand and, and volunteer for all sorts of committees, and I was not put on any committee in the judicial conference until the waning days of my judgeship when they finally put me on the IT committee, figuring <laughs> I can't do any harm, right? Little did they know. So uh, the, the problem, of course, Adam. is that this is not an intellectual debate. There, this is not a, a fair fight. The fact is, uh, you know, my firm is entirely comprised of lawyers that represent employees in, in employment disputes. And I will tell you, in the history of my firm, we have 45 lawyers. The employer has never admitted fault. They always think they're right. And the fact is, arbitration is an extension of that philosophy. They're there to win. This is not a fair fight. And in fact, it's going to get worse. I think what we'll see is, I describe it charitably as Joe's house of pancakes in arbitration. I don't see any reason why a company couldn't just simply hire their brother-in-law without a law degree and essentially have a system where you can't possibly win. I don't see how we can avoid that result if they really want to press this. In fact, to make the point, I've had management side lawyers say that they think that they can enforce class waivers in federal court basically rip out of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure, Rule 23. They think they can enforce that. So where does this end? I think, you know, it's just a, a question of you know, how far down the hole do we go before somebody says, this is not America, this is not justice as described by our founders. And, you know, I think we may wind up there. Well, let, let me sort of move off a little bit from arbitration as the alternative. And we've talked about this, about the limitations on class action a little bit. Um, where, where is that going? Oh, sure. Go right ahead. Please, thank you. So my name is Eddie Eichens. I'm the president of the union, uh, federal workers. Uh, so I don't actually litigate. I, I would hire people. But we, and our opponent is the United States government. We, we, first of all, negotiate the arbitration rules in, the collect, in a collective bargaining agreement. We use arbitration all the time. And we win all the time. Fair Labor Standards Act, we won a huge case uh, for, you know, I represent 100 employees. We're now involved in a case. When we, we now 
now are so successful, our union, AFGE, that we have some, we have uh, attorneys who are hired as, quote, legal rights attorneys because we can't do all the work or, or with the private sector can't do all the work. And we want to keep it in-house and, and funnel the money on, on less lucrative cases. And these attorneys are basically paid through the uh, attorney fees that are awarded by the arbitrator. If we have had absolute, and in terms of even when we do hire private attorneys, there is, the private attorneys have often given us money back from their fees to create a, a, a pool for cases, again, that are less lucrative. So we've had absolute, complete success in arbitration. It's almost like a different universe. Uh, we never, we don't like to use the EO, uh, the EO, you know, the EO rules, I mean, the EO law, because it's so slow. It takes years and years and years. When we file a grievance, again, for the collective bargaining agreement, we can get justice on discrimination, whether it's for a class or for individuals, much, much faster. And of course, as you said, we have a panel. We're involved in choosing the panel. But that, but is, isn't a key, and I'd like to hear from the panel as well, you started by saying the arbitral rules are negotiated in your collective bargaining agreement. Right. Right. Kat, the, aren't we talking about just the exact reasons why Title VII was enacted because individuals did not have labor protection uh, and so it was necessary to come up with a whole other enforcement scheme. The team and, the and the labor unions were, you know, frankly, there have been some problems with the labor unions. You know, USB Teamsters is, is the paradigmatic Title VII case. It's not, so right. there are conflicting interests here. Right. Fatima? I, mean, I think the example that you raise highlights the problem because it, you came up with the rules, it's knowing, it's voluntary. We're t you know, you have a pre-dispute mechanism, there's probably a post-dispute mechanism. And so, it, it, you know, if, if everyone had that sort of backing in arbitration, this would probably be a very different discussion. We need more unions. Well, okay. okay, we can turn to that. Yes, uh, <laughs> Alan? No, I was just going to, uh, not to jump on the bandwagon, but uh, of course your experience makes a lot of sense because we're not talking about a situation where you have a complete disparate unequal bargaining power. You've described a situation where it's quite the opposite. You may be as powerful, if not more powerful, than the people you're negotiating with uh, with respect to the provisions in the arbitration contract. I just want to throw out one other uh, example of the opposite and where this thing can go. And a lot of private commercial arbitration provisions, what, we, what I have seen in recent years is that uh, the, the parties that, uh, are, that draft the arbitration provisions have now included terms uh, in which um, they, the arbitrator has to have a specialized oh, knowledge and expertise. Uh, uh, and th to throw out how that might work as a pragmatic matter in this discussion, let's assume you're talking about, in the consumer context, electric power and people that are uh, um, consumers buying electricity for your homes. Obviously, like the telephone, a cell phone, something that we can't live without in the 21st century. So you have a power company that hypothetically puts an arbitration uh, provision uh, in its contract and embedded within the arbitration provision says, if we have to go to arbitration, we don't have three arbitrators, we only have one. And the one arbitrator has to be somebody with specialized knowledge of the industry, including you know, cogeneration, electric power, and the economics about how that operates. Now, how f talk about the unfairness. Again, it goes back to the comments about also the forum selection clauses. Where does it end in terms of what you can negotiate and put in an adhesion contract for arbitration? Hmm. And it's a problem. It's just the opposite of what you described in the labor unions. I want to broaden this a little bit because we were talking about access to justice not only in terms of channeling people to arbitration, we were talking about the limitations on class action. Uh, I know that Scott wanted to talk about attorney's fees issues uh, and also talking about motions to dismiss all the ways in which it's not just channeling to arbitration, it's also constraining private litigation uh, in the ways we described. Yeah. Eric. Uh, yeah. Um, in my practice, antitrust class actions, uh, I'm personally, or my cases are personally more affected by the ratcheting up of the burdens for class certification um, than it is by arbitration clauses. And what I mean by that, among other things, uh, after the Comcast decision, but a trend in decisions leading up to that, 
you, you as a plaintiff basically need to prove your case to the judge as a matter of fact on the merits or at least certain aspects of the merits before you can ever hope to get to a jury. So you, and, and that is just for class certification because the standard basically is you have to have evidence capable of proving your case on a class-wide basis at trial. You have to show that you have that evidence at class. And the defendant says, well, if it doesn't prove your case on a class-wide basis, then it clearly is incapable. So basically you're in, a, you're in a forum where you have to prove essentially big aspects of your case regarding impact on class members and damages to the judge at the class certification stage. If you win, it's a one-way ratchet. If you win, you get your class certified, but all of those findings go away. They're not binding on the jury, and some judges say they're not even binding on the judge at summary judgment. And then, if you lose, you're basically out of court. So you have to prove your case at class just so you can get to a jury to prove your case to a jury, and that ends up impinging upon your, uh, your right to a jury trial, and it makes cases much more expensive to litigate, much more time-consuming to litigate, and much more difficult to litigate. Um, and I just wanted to address uh, the comment regarding low claims rates and put it into this context. There we go again. <laughs> um, well, one of the, one of the big, I think there's a tension in some of the challenges to class actions. So one of the arguments is that class certification allows a group of consumers or small businesses to essentially blackmail a monopolist, in my cases, to pay too much money, even for unmeritorious cases. And um, so we've, and I, I don't actually see why that would be so. It just basically levels the playing field, in my view. But, uh, but what has happened is, as a result of that argument, with no empirical proof, there's no proof that, that uh, a monopolist has paid more than litigation costs for uh, unmeritorious cases. Why, why, would you, why would you do that? Why not just, if you believe you have a meritorious case and the class is certified, you can win in one fell uh, stroke and eliminate liability mm. for all time if you're right, so why not do it? But the point I wanted to make is that, so they make this argument about legalized blackmail, then they ratchet up the burdens for class certification, making it more difficult, more expensive, more time consuming. So that ultimately lowers the ultimate settlement value of the case. If you lower the settlement value of the case, the class members get less. Then they say, well, look. How little they're getting. No, the class members aren't getting any money. Well, you, it seems to me there's a tension in that argument. It, that also relates to questions about discovery, because at least whatever the issues are with respect to class certification, it comes after you have had discovery. Some of the other issues that we have talked about, about motions to dismiss, for example, the Iqbal rule, which enables a federal judge to decide whether the allegations in the complaint are plausible. These are decisions that are made without discovery on the face of the complaint. So people that don't have access to information, which are some of the people we're talking about here, and not unions, uh, don't have the ability to defend themselves. Cyrus. Well, yeah, I just wanted to follow up on what you just said and what Suzette said earlier. We have federal rules that are meant to be neutral. And what we're really facing, why the problems are so vexing, is that we have five justices who are acting as a super legislature. They are really in the mission to repeal the laws of the 20th century. And that, and that doesn't, if they're not going to de defer to Congress, they're not deferring to the judges who came up with the federal rules or the advisory notes. So a good example is on the motion to dismiss stage. There's a reason why the rule, there's a rule eight for simple plain notice for many areas of the law, particularly important in civil rights or employment discrimination, there's a big disparity of information, and Rule 9b of particularity. And what they've done with Iqbal and Twanli is they've essentially imported Rule 9b into these other areas of law where uh, Rule 8 has been governing. They de basically demolished Rule 8. And it doesn't matter what the rules are, they just, because they're uh, such an activist court, they just want to shut down access to the courts, and that's what they're going to it do. Also, it also raises Elizabeth's point. The rationale in Iqbal and Twombly started off with Twombly, which was an antitrust case. And so the rationale of the antitrust case was that there were high transaction costs and that for in litigating these cases, and therefore justifies the judge intervening at an earlier stage. Then that was applied to 
Iqbal. But in employment cases, civil rights cases, there are not the same kind of transaction costs as antitrust cases, and yet the same rule was applied. Let me go to Paul, Suzette, and then Elizabeth. Um, about the Iqbal case, you, um, Judge, when you pointed out that the word plausibility was imported in, I think that that's really crucial because it's such an incredibly subjective and manipulable term. And so when we look at some of the other possible changes that are being talked about to the federal rules, you look at the experience of Iqbal. One of the things that's happened is there's been an enormous empirical uh, study that's being developed where they're going through what's happened to motions to dismiss. And it's going to turn out that by an overwhelming percentage, you're going to find out that um, judges appointed by Presidents Reagan, Clinton, the first President Bush, um, are essentially granting motions to dismiss pretty much at the same rate they were granting them before the Iqbal case. I left out a president. Um, president George W. Bush's uh, nominees to the, to the district courts are granting motions to dismiss at a far higher rate than they were before the Iqbal case. So adding this word plausibility ends up injecting a level of subjectivity that allows who, who the judge is to have this big decision. You talk about transubstantivity being the same rules for everybody. Well, it becomes really ugly when you start having rules saying, well, do you personally th read this complaint and feel moved by it, Your Honor? And if the judge says, you know, that doesn't really grab me. I don't feel plausible about it. I don't really like it. I can just throw it out. Well, seeing that kind of disparity between different sets of president's picks is really a disastrous way of setting the law. So now when you talk about we're going to change the discovery rules, so we're going to add in, oh, well, are the costs of this case proportional? Well, just as Justice Kennedy thought, well, you know, the cost of civil rights cases are this big burden on the civil rights, on, on, the, on the federal courts, but Adam over there doesn't really feel like he's a burden on the courts. He feels <laughs> like he's representing, you know, employees who need, who need justice. Um, the idea that what the law is depends on sort of the length of the emperor's foot rather than that we have a measurement of foot that's 12 inches is a really troubling idea. Just as a footnote, the, what you're talking about is, so there was the Iqbal decision which, which enabled a judge to make essentially more subjective judgments about the legitimacy of a complaint at an early stage. And now the advisory rules committee is considering, I think it's still in the consideration stage, enabling a judge to decide whether the discovery that is requested is proportional to the allegations in the complaint. Now, proportional could mean one of the standards I saw was proportional to the importance of the claim. Oh, my goodness. Uh, and, and so that essentially a judge is intervening now subjectively in terms of what discovery you deserve. Now, you intervene to some degree deciding whether or not the discovery is relevant, whether or not it's burdensome. But this is adding an additional layer of intervention, which looks more like a merits intervention. Suzette, Elizabeth, and then Myron. So a couple of things. Um, um, Alan had mentioned this notion of like, well, who's, who makes up the advisory committee? I think that that's really important, that question, and who gets to control who's on the advisory committee, because many of us aren't really paying any attention to that. Um, so it goes to the, you know, the importance of having diversity, that group of people, uh, whether it's professional diversity, uh, you know, gender, race, you name it, they have a lot of power. And so we're focusing on judicial nominations and diversity in those areas. We really need to think about, well, who makes up the people who actually make the federal rules of civil procedure? Because that, that exercise is really important and can have a disparate impact on the substantive claims that we think about. Um, the other thing I was going to mention is um, I was going to just throw in Walmart here in terms of the impact um, on class actions that Walmart has had. And we have this heightened commonality, heightened, um, commonality standard. And in the Walmart case, you've got, um, you know, now plaintiffs are required to put forth significant proof that there was a discriminatory policy. And so, again, heightening the standard for employment discrimination and civil rights cases in a way that looks neutral but has a disparate, um, uh, a disparate impact. I think the, the, the impact of Walmart, um, in some ways, it's, not, it's not, maybe not as large as you would think because Walmart is an outlier. You're talking about 1.5 million um, people who are alleging systemic discrimination nationwide. So it doesn't look the same as the cases. But I think the, the danger of Walmart that we're seeing is that the theory that the plaintiffs relied on, this notion of excessive subjectivity being a vehicle for discrimination, that's very common. And that's going even beyond the Title VII context. You start seeing 
excessive subjectivity in um, uh, lend lending practices. So cases under the Fair Housing Act, under Equal Credit Opportunity Act, under Section 1981, all of those are starting to get hit again because of that um, excessive subjectivity is the vehicle for discrimination. That's interesting. So, mm -hmm. I'm going to skip to Scott because I don't think you, you had your hand up and I wanted to make sure that you spoke. I, I just want to be sure that, uh, I mean, I want to comment on this idea of proportionality. Unfortunately, it's been going on in terms of the, on the discovery side for, for a while. I know John Beiser and I just went through an exercise uh, recently where um, we had asked Merck for some production of, of information and core data that was critical and central to the plaintiff's burden in terms of a damage model. And um, Merck was successful, or actually, you know, convincing the trial court that it was going to be a hugely expensive uh, idea and that, you know, it was, the request was sort of, certainly out of proportion to what our claims were. And it could very well have gone that way, you know, and, and the court ended up you know, sort of cutting the baby in half. Uh, so this idea of proportionality is, fortunately for us, I think has been going on much longer than what you're anticipating about coming into the, new, into the advisory committee comments. Uh, those who have been involved in the advisory process may know more than I. There was always a notion of the, whether or not these discovery requests were burdensome, whether it was out of proportion. There was some notion of proportionality long before that. This is now where the plaintiff has to show initially justify that this is a proportional request and some of the criteria for proportionality, it really involves more of a merits determination. It's like that landmines that uh, Senator Whitehouse was talking about yesterday, I think it finds its roots in the proportionality that's already, you know, in being used by some of these courts. Okay, we have, I'll allow two more people in the queue and then we'll open this up for questions and answers. That's what I've been told to do. Elizabeth. Yeah, this, uh, this was going to start out as a comment on uh, trans substantivity and it's become a spontaneous uh, confession. I'm a member of the advisory <laughs> committee. Um, appointed by Chief Justice Roberts. Imagine my surprise. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't have an You have a right to remain silent. Anything you have to say, uh, maybe. I, I'm sure it will. So this is all your fault. Uh, uh, no. Uh, but, you know, there, there's, there, and I can tell you this, there is a perennial debate within the committee, and there has been for years and years, on trans-substantivity and whether the federal rules can operate across substantive lines. And it, it, is, it is very difficult to change at this point. So I think trans it's very difficult to change any rules. Uh, Transubstantivity will remain, but here's the thing. Um, there is a public process, a uh, public comment process, public hearing process that the committee does take seriously. And what has happened in the past is that not all bars and segments of the legal profession have weighed in. Uh, it's very important that you do so. Uh, the meetings are public, the hearings are public, the public comment periods are posted, they're on the internet, and I'm often surprised at how unfamiliar most of us are with the way the committee operates. That has to change. Uh, a lot of sunshine is a very good thing, and I will tell you this. Uh, no, I'm not personally happy with all of the discovery uh, amendments that were approved by the full standing committee, but I can tell you this. Um, members, particularly of the employment bar, were particularly influential in coming out and speaking out and being heard and changed the committee's mind on some of the discovery amendments that would have reduced presumptive limits of depositions. And those changes did not survive. Uh, what, what was important in proportionality, which is a very difficult new thing for people to navigate, I agree with that, but there wasn't burden shifting there. Uh, I think the rule might be misread as to who has the burden. Okay. The burden isn't on, it's not, it's not apparent. Um, but I think it is important that everyone be involved in the rulemaking process and not wait until a new rule comes out and then says, whoa, uh, I don't like this. What does this mean? Where did it come from? Why did they do this? Um, it's very important. And um, in the past, um, there has been disparate influence by those who could afford to be part of the rulemaking process from the beginning. And those of us who practice you know, for investors, for consumers, for small businesses, for employees, uh, you know, in the civil rights arena, uh, need to be, uh, to be heard there. Twombly-Iqbal, uh, the Rules Committee was affronted that the Supreme Court 
uh, which considers itself the boss of the rules, by the way, had taken it upon itself to reinterpret the rules in a way that was a surprise to the committee. So we did a study, more statistics, and yes, uh, there are mo more motions to dismiss granted, not significantly so, but here's what was found. Most judges out in the field uh, will not dismiss cases with prejudice despite Twombly Iqbal, but the motion is made in every case. So it has added to transaction costs. It has added to cost and delay. Oddly enough, uh, a, a, ple a judge made pleading rule, Supreme Court made pleading rule that was meant to reduce cost and delay has increased it. And that's what we all have to look out for. Uh, and that is the challenge in the committee. You know, are you gonna, are you, are you gonna improve something by making it more expensive and longer and more difficult. That is the problem, and that's what anybody involved in making rules, and judges too, I think, need to hear about from us. So I have a note that says, Dear Judge Gertner, 15 minutes left for question and answer. Thank you. It's very polite. Oh. Uh, I think I'm going to turn from the panel to your questions. Anyone have a question? Yes. Yeah. Um, can you stand up so we can hear you? Sure. Right, and you have a. Uh, oh, thank you. <laughs> Uh, really a comment, or, or two comments, and coming at this from the perspective of the plaintiff's employment bar, and I also represent unions, so I know a lot about labor arbitration, but I think there's a subtext here that hasn't really been discussed, which is that this is really about economic inequality, or, you know, what, what we're going to do about that. I'm settling a case right now that is a class action minimum wage case. It's a minimum wage case, for God's sake. And we were able to keep this in federal court because, honestly, the employer didn't keep up with developments in the law on its arbitration clause. And there have been many, many cases involving employees of the same company that have been sent to individual arbitration where people have actually tried to assert the same claim on a class basis that we did. Um, but by the time those employees were employed, the, the clause had, had been updated. So the, the notion that an employer can insulate itself from paying the minimum wage, I, I just think is shocking and ought to shock the conscience of any real right-thinking person. Um, Insulate by creating an arbitration clause? And yeah. A, no and there yeah. would be no class arbitration. And then, then, you know, it has no incentive to change its, its policies to comply with the law. Um, but the other thing that I feel has gone unsaid here is there is actually an institution in this country that can do something about this, and it's the Congress. <laughs> they, they have the power to to. to to fix this, and why are we not talking about that? Does anyone want to answer the question of why we're not talking about the Congress? Or is that a rhetorical question? I'm sorry, Fatima. House of Representatives. Right. It's, a little, it's the House. I mean, it's a little bit rhetorical, but I do think it's important to start spelling out what should the rule be, what should the law be, even if you think you can't move it at this moment. And, and that's in some ways the optimist in me, but some ways so that you are articulating this notion of inequality and that there is a policy solution. But I, I, have, I have to admit, I have two points that I have to, I'm supposed to be the moderator, I can't control myself. Um, <laughs> one is th that these really are unbelievably low visibility decisions. So the, the pe we know about it and the people in this audience know about it. You need, someone needs to do an op-ed, someone needs to do something on television, people have to understand that the net effect of these thousand cuts is to undermine these areas of the law. The other thing is an advocacy point. Uh, these rules have so, have made important social legislation all about picky procedural rules. And I kept on wanting lawyers in my court to say, somewhat side or another, the implication of this rule for this field is X. You didn't have to say that to me necessarily because I had been a civil rights litigator. But for other judges who, the, uh, who think that they are apparently enforcing neutral rules, neutral procedural rules, those implications are not at all clear. So we have to surface this both in court and we have to surface this publicly. 
That concludes my presentation. Yes. <laughs> yes. My comment or question is, uh, so Rule 23 and class actions aren't the only way to litigate on an aggregate basis. And I wonder what people think about in light of Italian colors, um, some alternatives for, for bringing claims together, or at least conducting discovery together, um, or, or anything like that. Using the multi-district litigation or just consolidating cases? Anyone? Yes, Mike. I think, I think with a lot of these rules, uh, you're going to have to find uh, some leverage with a defendant in a case. And um, under Italian colors, it's uh, going to be difficult if there's a protective order to do what you're suggesting. But in a given instance, it may be, uh, uh, and it's going to be slow in the beginning until it isn't slow anymore. Um, you know, the class actions got uh, a big, uh, not necessarily because of Rule 23, but it, it did with all due respect because the defense bar in the beginning wasn't very creative or good about it. So they got railroaded into lots of things that they didn't quite understand. This is not going to happen with the plaintiff's bar with these new procedural rules. It's gonna take a little while, but we're gonna figure out a way around them. And I'll give you just one example. Um, about uh, a year ago, I looked for a securities defendant that was low-key, where we have not a lot of other lawyers involved, who also had an arbitration clause. And I'm now down to settling the case with them, and I have told them that I am refusing to settle the case unless they remove their arbitration clause. Wow. And they said that has nothing to do with the case, and I hung up on their lawyer. I'm not going to... Uh, uh, I think there are a lot of creative ways uh, in uh, which he can do that, and I think a lot of it will come uh, from the plaintiff's bar. I don't think we're going to get any help from the rules because they're too generic. I don't think we're going to help get help from the courts because they're two one-off cases. I think we're going to get help in the trenches, uh, uh, and it's going to be a lot uh, easier to do. I'll turn to the panel. There's a, you want to have a question? We have another question. Uh, bring the microphone over here. Um, I'm wondering, I know that you all practice domestically, but do you think that international arbitration might be a more appropriate context for arbitration because um, I mean, I guess like the civil courts or the, the, the legal systems are not quite available in the same way as an alternative. And would it be better if uh, lawyers put their attention to developing that area instead um, in the arbitration context and trying to um, hold on to class actions in the domestic context? I, I will just say that uh, I have foreign clients who call and want to come into the United States courts and sue. They don't want to get involved in arbitrations. And in 1994, uh, President Clinton thought he was doing me a favor and he appointed me on the International Arbitration Association and no one ever called me. <laughs> let, let me get another question first. Uh, 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 yes. My question is from the mass torts point of view. I feel that before the arbitration, a lot of companies and businesses were doing the mass settlements and going into a bankruptcy type of form and having the settlement that whereby future claimants have no access to justice. I was wondering if the arbitrations were gotten rid of and it went back to almost a mass bankruptcy format and settlement issue, how future claimants would turn out on this issue. Elizabeth? Yeah, I, I think the, I think the, um, the mass bankruptcy had, had a lot of other causes. Uh, and a lot of these were asbestos driven. Uh, I don't see a, re a huge return uh, to mass bankruptcies regardless of what happens. Um, mass actions like mass tort actions use quasi-class techniques uh, to settle cases now. Uh, those can't bind future claimants by definition and they don't. Um, and I think Amchem has had the biggest influence on that. So really the only way uh, to bind future claimants is to follow the AMCHEM rules, 
the channeling injunctions for bankruptcies um, worked for some um, asbestos companies, but what we found out there, I think, is that, is that futures trustees are used to assure that there is appropriate funding for future claimants. So even in bankruptcy, uh, the AMCAM influence has been pervasive, and I think um, there's a, you know, those of us who were originally disconcerted with AMCAM need to remember that was a Justice uh, Ginsburg decision. I hmm. think the long-term uh, impact of that, if it's appropriately interpreted, is to protect the due process rights of future class members. And class and class actions can do that, or you know, companies are just going to face uh, future uh, liability, and some of them have chosen to do that. We have gotten the hook. I want to thank my panel and thank you all.